Wally is a uh, certified GIS professional. He, uh, he works, he's a senior research associate with the Eco Geomorphology and Topographic Analysis Lab. And I'm challenging them to combine most, more, more of those terms together. My, I suggest Eco Topo Geomorphographic Analysis Lab. We'll see if that takes. Um, the, um, he's uh, working on developing improved ways to delineate, characterize, and restore riparian areas in riverine ecosystems across the West, uh, particularly uh, use, uh, interested in the cheap and cheerful uh, approach to partnering with beavers and other, and other um, um, alternative restoration approaches. So his talk today is Modeling the Capacity of Riverscapes to Support Dam Building Beaver, Utah Statewide Implementation. Got all this stuff out. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. Yeah, I think I have it all figured out. Uh, starting out, I'd like to uh, thank my co-authors, Joe Wheaton and Martha Jensen, for their tremendous amount of work on this project. And first, I'm going to set the stage by addressing uh, the need. And so this is a report from uh, the EPA in 2006 on weightable streams. And their report indicates that over half are in a, a fair to poor condition based on the in-stream in characteristics, large woody debris, the bank angle, uh, just complexity. And I would say that the riparian zones are probably in a similar state. A poor conditioned example in the southwest context is the San Rafael, uh, San Rafael River in the Green River Basin. This is a photograph that I took from a, a Cessna plane, sticking, the, sticking it out the window. And so this shows this ditch-like system that's uh, evolved over time by uh, dewatering. You can see these old channels, and the riparian area has shrunk. The BLM is working on a master plan right now, a restoration plan, and one of their strategies is using beaver as a restoration agent. Also in their plan is dynamite, and I can't wait to to build a capacity model for using dynamite in riparian areas. But back to uh, Beaver. Uh, Carol did a really nice job, Carol Evans, at the BLM, showing the recovery of areas by Beaver. Nick, uh, Nick uh, Bowis also talked about some of the impacts. And there's, there's also been other uh, documents that have come out. This is something that Mary worked on. And so looking at, this is a photograph of a system not far from here called Spawn Creek. And you really see this as these dams are brought in, the complexity of the system increases, the roughness, the resilience. And you know, you're creating these ponding areas. You see these uh, habitats that are forming for fishes, for vegetation, mammals, and so forth, large woody debris, and this expansion across this area, these riparian areas. And then some ground rot water recharge elevated water tables, and the list goes on. Changes in time and delivery and storage of water, sediment, and nutrients. So this is the driver of why we use beaver as a restoration agent. But this is nothing new. If we look at this picture here, some of you may have seen this, but this is from 1949 in Popular Mechanics. And the, U the Idaho Division of uh, Fish and Game were dropping beaver out and using them as a flood control agent. So it's, it, logic is simple. Let's take advantage of where they might be a nuisance and let's put them in a place where they can uh, provide some engineering, their eco-engineering eco expertise. And this has really grown in popularity. Just recently, the New York Times has pulled it up, Washington Post, NPR, and we're getting to the point where we're actually building lodges for them. But one of the problems is we still don't know where they're going to work the best. We have maps such as this that are based on just the beaver predicted habitat. So greens and red here are showing critical and substantial value habitat. But I would argue that this map is not very useful. And I would say for, for a couple of reasons. One is we don't know at a watershed level and on a stream level where beaver would, would work. And more importantly, it's the beaver dams that are important, not the beaver themselves. So these are, these are the feedbacks, that, these positive feedbacks that we've, we've shown, others in this conference have shown. And so 
We know that beaver are in places like the Grand Canyon, but they're not building dams on these big rivers. So where they, where they build dams is much more limited. And it's limited by flow regimes and the availability of dam building material. And this is where our model comes in. And our model basically resolves where and at what level within a drainage network can dams be built and sustained. And it's a capacity model. We're answering the question, what is the maximum number of dams that a particular reach uh, can support? And our mapping unit here is 250 meter segments. And so kind of getting into the nuts and bolts of the presentation, I'll, I'll go over uh, BRAT, which is the Beaver Restoration Assessment Tool, and first focus on the capacity components. And then I'll go more into the idea that capacity modeling alone with Beaver because of their nuisance in certain situations is not enough. And that we, and I'll overview our decision support and planning tools that are associated with the model, show some Utah BRAT uh, results, which I'm really excited to share. These are fresh results. So I'm looking forward to uh, sharing this with you guys. And then some takeaways and some questions at the end. So for things that I don't cover, we've, we've got this really comprehensive website that Martha and Joe and I have created. And please, please visit this website, uh, brat.joewheaton.org, if you're interested in learning more. Because obviously, in the time I have, I'm not going to be able to cover everything. But what I'm going to focus on today are two components, the Beaver Dam capacity model and these decision support and planning tools. And this first, the capacity model, I'm going to run through some of these slides pretty quickly. So I apologize if I'm just cranking through. But I just want to give you guys some background on how the model works. And the basic inputs are pretty simple. Water, vegetation, and stream power is this limiting factor. So these are lines of evidence that we put within a, a fuzzy inference system. So the first line of evidence is a perennial water source. So from the literature, we know that on stream systems, we need at least a perennial water source. And in this case, with our statewide run of, uh, for Utah, we use existing uh, data that's um, compiled by the NHD, and it's a 24K, uh, 1 to 24,000 line network, and we're segmenting it down to 250 meter reaches. The vegetation layer we're using is land fire, and that's a 30 meter Landsat uh, derived vegetation layer or land cover data set, and it's nationally available. We're using existing and potential. Potential we can think of as pre-settlement or, or historic, and we're using both of those, and it's an important part of our model. And then as far as stream power, so stream power, this ability for uh, the river to do work, we're looking at both, both base flow, which is evidence that a dam can be built in the first place, and then whether it can withstand a typical flood, and we're using the Q2, kind of this reoccurrence interval every two years, that it can persist. So let's get into the deep, deep end of the model here. So I'm going to zoom into these areas. And basically, so what we're doing here is we've got the land fire classification. And we're now classifying it by these preferences by the beaver. So we know from the literature and from being out in the field, aspen, cottonwood, and willow are what we, ca we, we break these. We code everything to four. This is the preferred material all the way down to zero, such things as barren, developed, agriculture, and grassland. So think of these colors, because we're going to use these colors uh, throughout the mapping. So the next thing we do is uh, these suitability classes are averaged within two buffers. There's a streamside buffer, which is 30 meters, and a riparian upland buffer, which is 100 meters. So getting into the nuts and bolts of this, in A, and this might be difficult for you guys to see, but we have the line work that's segmented, and then we have a 30 meter and 100 meter buffer. And then in B, this is depicting the land fire data that's classified. And then this is showing our clips and these average values of the preferences uh, beaver have towards these building materials. And that, this is a 100 meter buffer. I think this might be more descriptive as far as this is a, another uh, photograph taken from our, our blimp looking down. And this is Spawn Creek. But this gives you an idea of this is an area that's been harvested by beaver. This is a skid trail, a beaver skid trail. And it really shows kind of the utilization, upper limits, 
And in certain situations, there will only be a 30 meter area where they're utilizing because you don't have these expanses of aspen. So finally, in the vegetation model here, we, excuse me, we take those values and we combine them with an FIS and we have this maximum density of dams. So what does that mean? So the, how the FIS works is we have rule tables. So we have these, we're computing with words. And so we're taking like this if statement, we're saying if, it's, if the suitability of the stream side buffer, 30 meter, is preferred, and the suitability of that larger buffer, the 100 meter buffer, is suitable, then we have a frequent category. And this frequent category would be uh, between uh, uh, 10 and 15 dams. And then if we go down to the preferred, we have preferred in both the buffers, we have this pervasive, and this will go all the way up to uh, from 16 to, to 40 dams. So the output is now an intermediate step and based solely on, solely on the building material. And this is plugged into the next model. And this, uh, this is the last model that I'll, I'll show here. So if you're glossing over. So this is our combined FIS. So in, in one here, we have input. And that's applied to the base flow in two. And that affects certain areas. In this case, it's not really affecting everybody, anything because the base flows are so low. But if we look at the two-year uh, flood reoccurrence, these red areas are areas that are limiting that vegetation input. And as these are combined, we have our combined and final output of the model. So I, I promise that's the gnarliest part of this presentation. And it'll get better. So as far as its outputs, our output categories are none in areas that are not, not uh, capable of supporting dam building, rare in barely capable areas. There might be a dispersing beaver here and there. Occasional, it's not ideal, but a, a small colony might build two to four dams in a line segment. And frequent, that's five to 15 dams, so it's sl slightly uh, resource limited. There might not be, say, that aspen stand. And then that pervasive is that area that I kind of showed in that slide where you have, you've got extensive dam complexes and you have the resources. So where are we at? So we've, we've run the, rat, the BRAT model for the whole state of Utah from funding from the uh, Division of Wildlife uh, Natural Resources. And we used, as I showed, the nationally available input data. So we've run it for the whole state. And now we've resolved uh, the data at a 250 uh, meter segment. So this image, and it might be difficult to see from the back, but all this all our line work is available as a KMZ or a shape files from the website. And this is just overlaid in Google Earth and it's showing uh, some of the results that we got from our validation and, and just showing the details of, of our output. So let's get into some of the results. So uh, just to reiterate, these are, our, these are estimates of capacity. So this is maximum plausible dams that are out on the landscape. And so we have existing and historic. And we see uh, down here that there's been about a 30% reduction in capacity. So green is the existing and, and blue is the historic. And where this, most of these changes are, so these black hash patterns, that's historic. So in the pervasive uh, uh, dam densities, that's where we've seen the reduction in those densities. So let's look a little closer at a particular area. And I'm going to toggle back these maps. So this is the northern uh, DWR region. And we'll look at some of the changes. So that's historic to existing, historic, existing. If we go to historic, what we, what, so we see these big changes in the pervasive. And these are associated with uh, land uses. And uh, let me just go back. Uh, tied in with urbanization and land uses uh, throughout the Wasatch Front. How does it look throughout the state at these different regions? A uh, similar trend, you see the reduction from the historic and the same uh, trend from the reduction in the pervasive uh, categories. 
So how does a model do when we go out and validate it? So we validated our model in these four watersheds uh, scattered throughout the state. And uh, we had a technician uh, who's here uh, that did this work, um, uh, Jordan Gilbert. He, in Google Earth, he scanned these 3,500 miles of river looking for dams and actually putting a point where every dam is. And then we did some additional uh, field verification in the Logan Ra uh, Ranger District here outside of Logan. And there's three forms of validation which I'm going to uh, briefly go over. Is uh, First we have, uh, are, they, are they spatially coherent and logical as far as what our model predicted? And so in this case, the line work is our model and our categories as described from none to pervasive. And what we're looking for are in areas that we predicted uh, no capacity, we're not finding dams in those areas, which is a good thing. Uh, low, low densities in occasional, and so, so if you use occasional classes, we have, there's low densities. And so I should point out that these, these uh, stars are dams, and these uh, numbered, these are actually dams as uh, broken out by counts. So this is a large complex that shows up in our pervasive and there's other large uh, complexes that also show up in our pervasive. So we feel like our model, in this particular validation, our model is doing quite well. Uh, moving on, we also looked at how to dam density track between predicted and actual. And the model effectively uh, segregated uh, uh, the factors controlling uh, beaver dam occurrences and densities 99% of the time. In other words, only five, 15 times out of uh, all the segments that we um, analyzed that had existing dam counts did we exceed what we found on the ground. So our model is doing a, a good job in that category as well. And then finally with the validation we used an electivity index and does the electivity index appreciably uh, increase from the none to pervasive? Maybe I'll take a little bit of time to describe what this is. First, this is the log scale, and on the x-axis we have, in the lighter color, we have the actual dam counts, and then the darker color is um, our capacity estimates. And then this is basically avoidance or preference, this dotted line, and then the dark line is that electivity index. So you have these increases, and that's showing that appreciable increase from, uh, from the none to pervasive. So we were really happy with those findings. This is pretty interesting as far as the validation watersheds, as far as the lack of uh, really capacity that's out on the landscape. It was uh, pretty striking. So what we found in, in the central and southern regions, they're only at about 1% of capacity. Whether, and then further up north, we're at 13% in the strawberry versus 16% in the Logan. And we, we hypothesize that this is related to um, attitudes towards beaver, trapping a beaver, shooting beaver out in um, some of these uh, areas. Back to the website if you have uh, more questions. The next thing I'm gonna cover is these decision and support and planning tools. And this is something that we've just started getting going on for this, this project. So these are a little more preliminary, but really promising. So one thing with beaver, it's kind of a double-edged sword. They're incredible ecosystem engineers, but they also can be a major nuisance. And they can cost a lot in property damage. And people can really be uh, you know, upset about beavers. And that's why the attitudes are the way they are. You know, they can uh, dam. Um, areas as far as and cause flooding of res residential areas. They can block culverts. They can chop down expensive orna uh, ornamental trees. And they can really cause havoc in irrigation uh, canals and uh, different structures uh, for diversion. So what we've come up with is a human beaver conflict model. And this is a simple inference system that uses GIS data to characterize potential points of conflict. And so with GIS data in Utah, we have canals, roads, we have culvert layer. 
We've got a, uh, railroads, and we can drive stream crossings by just intersecting the streams and roads. And within this model is also get, uh, land use and land ownership. So you probably can't see this, but this is kind of our workflow. And as you go through this, work, this uh, diagram, you come up with different probabilities. And we take the maximum probabilities and apply those to the 250 meter line segment. I'm gonna zoom into one of these so we can actually run through this. So we start and say, is a beaver dam in a conservation area? Is it in a wilderness area, basically? If yes, we just leave it alone. There's no conflict, so zero probability. If that isn't the case, we go on to here and say, is a beaver dam less than 50 meters from a culvert or road crossing? If yes, high probability, 90% probability. And th so this can be run for all those scenarios. And as we ran it, our, our output is this, and I think it's pretty coherent. If we look at the Uenta mountain range, these, this is all low probability. If we look at these uh, large rivers that are pretty isolated in uh, southeastern Utah, these are also low probability. And then the Wasatch Front is flagged as red. And in our bar graphs, that also uh, shows up quite nicely. And finally, an example within uh, Cache Valley of this, so this is, these are probability of conflict. Doesn't mean that there's necessarily gonna be conflict. And it's really predicated on whether there are beaver. So if we look at this zoom in area of this box, and yes, it is a Walmart, and they're about every eight miles across the US, and there is a dam, and there is a pond. But what's pretty amazing about this is Walmart wants to work with living with beaver solutions and to look at uh, they don't want to trap them out and kill them. They want to try to keep them there and make it so they're, they're worried about their parking lot. So they want to look at some of these, you know, beaver deceiver or pond leveler or, or something that might uh, provide them with those uh, assurances that their, their parking lot or their store isn't going to, going to get flooded. And if these don't work, uh, trapping and relocation, translocation is an option. And uh, call out to Kent Sorensen. He's got a poster that shows some of this translocation. And a really neat thing about this uh, tool is the idea that we can, we can translocate nuisance beavers. So finally, uh, we also, the last part of our model is this beaver management conservation restoration zone model, where we take, we basically take uh, a ratio of historic to existing so if we've seen areas that have degraded, we know that those are potential restoration areas, and then human conflict, and we segregate out into different conservation and restoration zones. So we have low-hanging fruit. So these are areas that are potential restoration conservation zones. We have quick return streams. We have long-term possibility streams, unsuitably, suitable, naturally limited, unsuitable, anthropogenically limited, and living with beaver. So once again, we have, uh, we have this uh, workflow where we can uh, go through and we can make these uh, decisions. And so for each category, so this is our existing beaver dam output. So say we're in the frequent category, and say um, historically there were, there were more, uh, more dams then we go, go through here and say, yes, there is. Is there a probability of conflict? And you know, if it's less than or equal to 50%, uh, this would be low-hanging fruit. So these are, these are the areas, these low-hanging fruit are designated as really nice areas to potentially uh, use beaver as restoration. And that throughout the state on this preliminary run, if we look at the, the green segments, they're about a third of the state and so these are really flagging uh, areas where we can use beaver as a restoration agent. So just to wrap up, the BRAT model is the outputs are uh, fourfold. We have a capacity model of existing, historic, then we have the probability of, of conflict, and then we have these beaver management zone conservation restoration areas. So some takeaways. Uh, we feel the BRAT 
model is a, a very, very powerful decision and support and planning tool that provides reach level information regarding where and at what level dam building beaver activity may be sustained and where and at what level potential beaver conflict might exist, where nuisance beaver uh, can be mitigated, and where living with beaver strategies may be needed. And then finally, and maybe most importantly, where and at what level we might use uh, beaver as a stream and restoration uh, agent. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank these people that without their help and insights, this project would have never happened. And once again, the website if you want more information. Thank you. So we've got time for a couple of questions. Um, yeah, in the back in the green. Right. Yeah. Uh, briefly summarize, um, what resources does it, does it take to support uh, beaver at a reach level? And really that, I mean, to be honest with you, that's probably outside my expertise. And uh, I, what I do know from the model is what we've, we've shown as far as what we're modeling as uh, capacity that's showing up nicely on the landscape. Um, there might be others uh, within the group that could answer that question better, but that's really beyond my expertise. Yeah, okay. Yeah, in the back here. This looks like a real usable tool. I'm just a little concerned about that dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you have to talk to about Justin Jimenez about that. That's kind of his idea. <laughs> I can't believe he got it approved, but he's a good used car salesman. <laughs> yes, Carol? Um, Carol asked, uh, basically what she saw in Nevada is the beaver didn't come in until the system was starting to recover um, already. And I think that ties back to uh, what Joe was bringing up too, is that our model will show the existing capacity and flag these areas as probably right now is not very suitable. But the idea with, with a little bit of change, a little nudge, uh, that they can get to a level where they could start supporting um, a beaver. And then those feedbacks, once they're in there, we see tremendous uh, change, and it's very rapid. But it does have to be at a threshold level where there's enough resources. I'm not. Oh, 
awesome. Cool, I'll have to think of that. Uh, one other or are we done? Yeah, that's a great plug. Uh, the question was, what about other states? And we are actively looking for funding to run this in other states. We're primed. We actually have run the edges of these uh, adjoining states. So if, you're any, if you know of anybody that wants it run for their state, let us know. <laughs> it's cheap, actually. They're cheap. They're sure